Well, let's get right down to business and open our Bibles to Acts chapter 3. If you brought a Bible along or if you have a Bible app uh, on your personal device, turn there so you can follow along uh, what is a very long passage to look at today. We're actually digging in to a chapter and a half from Acts 3, the beginning, to the middle of Acts chapter 4 that accounts for kind of one era or one story in the life of a couple of the early Christian church leaders named Peter and John. Now, obviously, we're not going to get kind of super deep into all of the minutia of the story. I'd encourage you to read through it maybe even multiple times in the coming week, especially if you're part of a life group that's going to be discussing this uh, later on in the week. But so that we all understand kind of the general contours of this whole story, I want to summarize it in terms of the four major kind of episodes or scenes that it includes. And so you can see here on the slide that, that this passage we're going to look at today is actually four different episodes or scenes. First of all, Peter and John, uh, they heal a man who's been crippled all his life. They heal a lifelong crippled man. And then after that healing, in response to that healing, Peter responds to the onlooking crowd who witnessed the healing. Shortly after that, they have to explain their actions to the religious leaders among them. And then after that, they return back to their uh, kind of home faith community and explain what happened and the church community reacts to their experiences. So just so we know where this is going today, those are kind of the four different scenes or, or episodes. And really, they represent four different audiences for Peter and John. Peter and John is the entire story, but there are these four audiences, this crippled man, the onlookers, the religious leaders, and then their faith community. So that's what we're going to kind of journey through today. Beginning with the first scene, Peter and John are heading to the temple in the middle of an afternoon where at the temple gate, they encounter this man who had either been crippled from birth or, or uh, shortly after and suffered a disability all his life. And in verse three, uh, we read this. It says, when the crippled man saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. And then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold, I do not have. But what I do have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. This story launches out of the gate with this like medically defying, miraculous healing encounter with this man. What's interesting to note, though, and I hope that you could kind of sense the tone in Luke's writing, is that the attention seems to be less on what happened, but more on how it happened. Did you notice the little details like Peter and John looked intently at the man and they commanded him to look at them? And just in the way that they kind of enacted that healing, there's this sense of confidence or this sense of like boldness that we haven't seen in Peter or John before. And it leaves a first century reader and ought to leave us today kind of wondering, like, where did that come from? What made them suddenly so confident and so bold in their faith? Well, they start to kind of explain that in the next episode or the next scene when the crowd of onlookers kind of follows them into the temple, eager to hear about what happened. Verse 12 of Acts chapter 3 says this. It says, when Peter saw the crowds running to them, he said to them, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness, we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. Now, I don't know if this strikes you as odd, but if you've kind of followed or are familiar with the book of Acts, I, I think it probably should, because if we remember back to the last couple weeks in Acts chapter 2, Peter and John, as part of this early church, had experienced the resurrection of Jesus and encountered him in resurrected, resurrected form before he ascended to heaven and then experienced what was called Pentecost and received the Holy Spirit for themselves. 
the big kind of news of their day was the resurrection of Jesus and the arrival of the Holy Spirit. And yet, when it comes to explaining this healing, they're using words like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the God of our fathers. The question is, what, what are they trying to explain or, or, or communicate by kind of looking so much in the rearview mirror? They actually continue on uh, explaining the second scene to the onlookers. Uh, they describe how these onlookers were part of the community kind of society that were responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus. But after explaining that to them, they kind of bring things back again to this rear view mirror look way back into kind of biblical history. Scroll down to verse 17, where it says this. Peter says, now fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance in crucifying Jesus, as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Indeed, beginning with Samuel, all the prophets who have spoken have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. D do you understand at this point what Peter seems to be trying to do? For sure, he's recognizing the reality of Jesus and his resurrection among them and recognizing the reality of the power that the Holy Spirit has now given them. But he's trying to make a deeper point that hopefully they can understand. He's trying to connect the dots from what they're experiencing today to what God had formerly predicted and spoken through prophets hundreds of years earlier. In fact, in this deeper analysis of this section, this second scene, he's recounting prophecies in Deuteronomy and prophecies in, in Genesis and all kinds of Old Testament moments where, where these prophets were given what's called a covenant, literally a promise or a guarantee by God of what was to come. And some of those were referred to as messianic prophecies or messianic promises, promises of a savior to be sent from God. And so what Peter's trying to communicate here is that as incredible as it is that Jesus has risen from the dead and as incredible as it is that the Holy Spirit has come upon them and given them this power, what's even more incredible is that all of what they're experiencing today is actually all of this long time covenant promises through Old Testament prophets fulfilled. All of what they're experiencing in Jesus and all of what they're experiencing in the Holy Spirit are God's promises delivered? Well, you'd think that that would kind of strengthen things, but it actually got them into a little bit more trouble because now the religious leaders showed up. This is now into scene or episode number three, and the religious leaders aren't too happy with them. They cut off this little mini sermonette and they throw them in jail overnight. And the next day, they haul them out and drag them in front of an entire group of all of the political and religious leaders of the day. And we pick up this third scene or this third episode uh, in verse 7 of Acts chapter 4, where it says there, the religious leaders had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Well, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Now, this response to those of us familiar with the, the story of Jesus and the story of the early church, this response probably shouldn't surprise us because it makes a bit more sense. The, the, where, where Peter is giving credit, kind of where credit's due to Jesus and to the power of his Holy Spirit so that they can understand how this miraculous healing happened. But I hope that you notice the way his comments end, because the way he ends it, he kind of directs the focus to these religious leaders 
in the exact same way that it seems like he directed the focus to the onlookers in scene or episode two, where he says that Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. That might not seem that significant to you, especially because that was a quote that Jesus said himself of himself, kind of about himself when he walked the earth. But in both cases, both Jesus and Peter here are quoting an Old Testament messianic prophecy in Psalm 118. And again, what he's saying in that Jesus is this, is he's trying to get them to take a a step back and see the bigger picture and appreciate the deeper reality that not only is the work and person of Christ incredible, and not only is the work and power of the Holy Spirit amazing, but that what's really phenomenal is that all of these things are products of God's long time covenant promises being fulfilled. That in the same way that he communicated to the onlookers after the miraculous healing, he's communicating to the religious leaders that all of Jesus and all the Holy Spirit and all this stuff happening in their day is actually God's promises delivered. Well, these religious leaders didn't have much to say after that, and so they eventually let Peter and John go, which meant that Uh, kind of at scene four, episode four, they returned back to their church community and they could explain to them uh, all that had happened from the healing to the uh, engagement with the onlookers to the response to the religious leaders. And we pick up episode four then uh, in verse 24 of Acts chapter four, where it says there, when the church community heard this, the report from Peter and John, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, You made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David, who said, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Do you recognize this tone? Do you recognize this approach? Because it seems as if after receiving the report from Peter and John, the first century church responds in an exactly same way, a kind of a mirrored version of the way that Peter and John responded both to the onlookers and to the religious leaders. Here, they're not citing the the text that already had been uh, referred to. Here, they're citing Psalm 2 and quoting King David, which was another messianic prophecy where, again, like Peter and John, they're kind of appreciating that all of this awesome Jesus stuff and all this awesome Holy Spirit stuff that they're experiencing in their day is actually the product of God's long-time, covenantally guaranteed promises made through prophets dozens of people hundreds of years ago that are being fulfilled in their midst. And as incredible as it is that they're putting their trust in Jesus and reliance in the Holy Spirit, what is really incredible to them is that all of this to them represents God's promises delivered. Do you see the trend of what's happening in this passage, especially after the miraculous healing in scenes or episodes two and three and four? Time and time again, it seems like the attention is being drawn to a a deeper level, not just what's happening in front of them, but what's happened for hundreds of years through dozens of prophetic voices to kind of thread the needle through their current reality so that again and again and again, they they can appreciate that what they're experiencing today through all of Jesus' activity and all of the power and activity of the Holy Spirit is actually God's promises delivered. And I think that the reason that Luke accounts for the, the, the story of the life of Peter and John in this way is actually to answer the question from episode one that was kind of left unanswered. 
Because if you remember, in the miraculous healing of the, the crippled man, there was this like shocking confidence or surprising boldness that they exuded that would have left readers, if not us today, wondering, where did that come from? And I think Luke's point in accounting for the story in the way that he did is to answer that very question. That these followers of Jesus and this early church and these church leaders were able to live with a deeper rootedness and a deeper confidence and a stronger sense of boldness for one specific reason. Because they weren't just enjoying a trust in Jesus and a reliance on the Holy Spirit. They were appreciating that all of this Jesus stuff and all of this Holy Spirit stuff was actually hundreds of years and dozens of Old Testament prophetic voices providing God's covenant promises that were being fulfilled in their midst. And through taking that bigger picture, deeper level perspective, their faith and their confidence could exist at a deeper level because they could appreciate that all of what they were experiencing today was God's promises delivered. Now, I wonder for you and I today whether we can appreciate the difference in those two perspectives, the difference between, in a sense, just trusting in Jesus and relying on the Holy Spirit, as incredible as that is, versus this deeper understanding of appreciating where all of that came from and that all of that they got to experience and all of what you and I, if we're following Jesus, get to experience today is the product of dozens of prophetic voices over hundreds of years recounting God's covenant guaranteed promises. And if we can appreciate that, Perhaps our faith can deepen and strengthen and our confidence and boldness can grow as well. Because there is a difference between something being incredible and that something being incredible having been predicted and guaranteed all along and then delivering. There's a different kind of confidence you can have when that's the case. Best example uh, I can give of this to try to help us understand this is of a time uh, years ago when one of the greats in uh, NHL ice hockey actually became truly one of the greats. A guy by the name of Mark Messier uh, played with and won four Stanley Cups with Wayne Gretzky uh, on the Edmonton Oilers, which might not sound like much. You and I could both convince ourselves that if we played with Wayne Gretzky, we'd probably win Stanley Cups too. It's like shooting fish in a barrel. But after Wayne Gretzky got traded to Los Angeles, Messier stayed with Edmonton and actually won a fifth Stanley Cup. And so he started to kind of establish himself as a, a truly great player. But Marc Messier didn't enter into the lore of the true greats of the NHL until years later when he was playing for the New York Rangers. It was in 1994. The Rangers were in the third round of the Stanley Cup playoffs, and they were down three games to two to their nearby rivals, the New Jersey Devils. But on the day of game six, after the morning skate, when they had the media scrum, Marc Messier did something that almost no professional athlete has ever done before. He guaranteed a Ranger win that night. He promised that the Rangers would win that game six. And it just blew up the media. You can see the, the, the newspaper headlines. And it certainly lit the New Jersey Devils fans and their players on fire a little bit. To the point where uh, at the beginning of game six, the Devils got off to an early lead and were up 2 nothing. But by the time the third period uh, was underway, the Rangers had closed the gap to 2-1. to one. But in that third period, Marc Messier himself scored the game-tying goal. And then a few minutes later, Messier scored the go-ahead goal so that the Rangers were up 3-2. to two. And then as time was winding down, Messier cleared the puck into the empty net and scored a hat trick, icing the win for two Rangers and sending, sending them back to Madison Square Garden for a decisive Game 7 where the Rangers would win and then go on to win the Stanley Cup. Apologies to my brother whose team they beat in the Stanley Cup finals. What's the point of all of that? The point is that for Marc Messier, scoring a hat trick in game six of uh, round three of the Stanley Cup finals and, and delivering a victory was certainly incredible. To those of us who are Leafs fans, it's really incredible because we've never seen anything like it in this generation. 
But what put Marc Messier into hockey lore wasn't that he scored a hat trick that day or even that the Rangers won. It was that he promised and guaranteed that they would and then delivered on that promise. Do you see the difference between something being amazing and something being way more incredible when it's been promised and guaranteed in advance and delivered? That's the very point that I believe Luke is trying to draw out in Acts chapter 3 and 4 for his original readers and for you and us today. That it's one thing to celebrate being able to trust in Jesus and rely on the Holy Spirit. That's incredible for sure. But what is more phenomenal that we can root our faith and confidence in in a deeper way that can generate a stronger degree of boldness and assurance and identity and security in our faith is the confidence to know that the very things we can experience in Jesus and in the Holy Spirit were God's promises delivered. The question is, how can we experience that to a greater degree in our day today? Well, first of all, we've got to appreciate that there is one promise that God has provided that has yet to be fully delivered. Peter actually referred to it in the second episode of the story today uh, when he was talking to the to the onlookers after the miraculous healing. I skipped over it, but we can look at it in Acts 3 verse 21, where he says there that heaven must receive Jesus until the time comes for God to restore everything, as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. What he's describing there is the reality of Jesus' ascension to heaven, but also of his promised return to earth that results in an era that they found themselves in, that we still live in today, that we often refer to as already and not yet. Jesus has come and lived and died and rose again and ascended to heaven already, and we can experience the reality of that in our lives. But the fullest, completest work of Jesus won't happen completely and fully until he returns to earth again. And as the scriptures teach, he establishes what's called his new heaven and his new earth, where among other places in Revelation 21, it says there will be no more sadness or mourning or death or crying or pain, and everything will be as it ultimately is intended to be. We live in that already and not yet economy and reality today, but we have to appreciate the same thing that Peter wanted his audiences to appreciate in Acts 3 and 4, that just because God's covenant promises haven't been realized completely doesn't mean that we can't experience and claim them fully today. Just because the fullness of God's covenant promises haven't been realized completely doesn't mean we can't experience them fully today. And so again, the question for you and I is, what promises of God do you want to claim today that if you can appreciate have been realized perfectly in Jesus, you can claim with a greater degree of confidence and boldness than perhaps you ever have before? What kind of promises are you looking to claim today? Are you uncertain about your future? For example, you've got a choice to make or a cloudy, indeterminate future and it causes you anxiety and you would love nothing more than for God to provide you guidance and to make your paths straight as you acknowledge him in the way that he's promised. Maybe you're feeling the financial pinch and there's all kinds of economic stress in your life and you'd like nothing more than to experience God coming alongside and being a provider to you, caring about you more than he does the birds of the air or the flowers of the field, just the way he's promised. Or maybe you're navigating a medical challenge or you're in real deep with some health issues and you would love nothing more than to experience the presence and closeness of a comfort and comfort of a God who will never leave you and forsake you, just as he's promised. Or maybe you're in a relational rift and you're trying to kind of resolve a conflict or hope that a conflict would resolve and would love nothing more than for God to be with you and wherever two or three are gathered, for God to be in their midst and work things out among them just the way he's promised. Or maybe you're just ravaged by guilt and shame from your past and desperately need God to come and assure you that he not only forgives your sin, but that he throws it away as far as the east is from the west and remembers your sin no more, just as he 
promised. What promises that Jesus has realized do you need to claim for your life today? Do you even know the promises of God? Do you remind yourself of the promises of God? Maybe write sticky notes and post them throughout your car or on your work desk or you know, throughout your, your, your bedroom or on your kitchen cabinets or somewhere where you can remind yourself of these very promises that you can claim today because in Jesus and in his Holy Spirit are all of God's promises delivered big idea today is that there's a difference between something being incredible and that something incredible being promised and guaranteed long ago and being delivered. There's a deeper level of confidence that we can have in that very thing. And when it comes to God, that's what Luke is drawing to our attention in the passage today. That it is incredible to be able to put our trust in Jesus and to be able to rely on the Holy Spirit in our day and age. But what is actually more incredible is that all of that represents dozens of people over hundreds of years through whom God spoke and made covenantal guarantees of promises that he has through Jesus fully delivered. And so he invites us to appreciate that and allow our confidence to strengthen so that we can live a faith of boldness, not just trusting in Christ and not just relying on the Holy Spirit, but appreciating in that confident, bold, deeper level that all of those things are God's promises delivered. Let's pray together. Jesus, we're just so thankful today, not only that we can follow you, but in who you are and who you were promised to be so many times throughout history that we can claim as promises delivered in our lives right here and right now. Jesus, I pray that for each of us, you would remind us or even teach us this week of promises that you and your Father have made throughout history that we can claim in you today because of your victorious work on the cross. And I pray that that kind of faith would deepen and strengthen and give us a confidence and a boldness in you that maybe we've never known. Do that personally, Jesus, and do that collectively across our locations as a church community so that in this season we can rise up with a confidence and a boldness in our faith that maybe we've never known before, not just because we're trusting in you and relying on your Holy Spirit, but because we understand that you are God's promises delivered and we take tremendous strength in that truth. We thank you, Jesus, for our time together today. We pray all these things in your name. Amen.